Am I up in the balcony? Thanks for coming. We're going to elect Bernie Sanders the next president of the United States.
country, I began to think that, you know what, maybe the frustration level is high enough that people want a politics and an economics that go outside of establishment approach. The second issue that I was asking myself in this day and age, especially with this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision, could we raise enough money? And, and the reason for that, to run a strong and winning campaign, I knew from day one that I did not want and will not accept money from billionaires and super PACs. Don't know. My family, I was raised in a family that never had a lot of money. For me, politics is not complicated. It has a lot to do with that old song, which side are you on? I know which side I am on and always have been. But the question was, if you're not going to have a super PAC, if you're not going to raise money for millionaires and billionaires, could you raise enough money to run a winning campaign? And what I'm, from the bottom of my heart, proud and overwhelmed to tell you that we have received more individual contributions, to the best of my knowledge, than any other candidate for president. We have over 300,000 people have made contributions. And you know what's extraordinary? You know what the average contribution is? It's 35 bucks. How's that? <laughs> this is a people's campaign, not a millionaire's campaign. And yes, yes, we will be outspent. Billionaires and millionaires are piling huge amounts of money. And the situation is so absurd that if I'm not mistaken, in virtually every major campaign, the super PACs will have more influence over the campaign than the candidate's own campaign. Do you believe that? That is how absurd the situation is right now. And then when I try to determine what kind of support we would have, what we have found in the last few months, is that we have brought more people out to events like this evening in Exeter. This is an extraordinary turnout. We had five or six hundred people in Manchester earlier today. We had seven, eight hundred people in Portsmouth. We have had the largest crowds in Iowa. We have had 11,000 people coming out in Phoenix, Arizona. is to say very loudly and clearly that the Democratic Party has made a major mistake in writing off half of the states in America. We need a 50-state strategy. And what, that means, and what that means is when folks in states like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, we have huge numbers of people who have no health care, people who are working for $7.25 an hour, Huge numbers of people living in poverty. We cannot turn our backs on those people. We're going to campaign and fight for them as well. And when we talk about citizen participation, about revitalizing American people, about ordinary folks reclaiming their government that people fought and died for, just Wednesday night, if you can believe this, it's really, again, blew me away. All these things, you know, we never anticipated, never in my life, three or four months ago, could I imagine this. We did something unprecedented in American political history. This early in the campaign, <clears throat> we had a digital organizing evening. We had meetings in 3,700 locations in 50 states in America, bringing out over 100,000 people. So I am enthused 
about the momentum that this campaign has, and with your help, I believe we have an excellent chance to win in New Hampshire. I believe we can win in Ohio. I believe we can win this election. I need your help, obviously, to win here in New Hampshire and to win this primary and caucus process. But here's something else I need, and no other candidate for president will tell you this. The truth of the matter is that the powers that be in Washington, D.C., corporate America, Wall Street, huge campaign contributors are so powerful, have so much influence in terms of what goes on, that there is no way that any president, not the best, not me, anybody else, can bring forth and implement an agenda for working Americans without a political revolution. And what that means, and here's the bad news to you, it means not only do I need your help to get me elected, I need your help the day after the election. Barack Obama is a good friend of mine. We have disagreed on a number of issues, and I'll talk about that in a moment. In 2008, Obama ran one of the great campaigns in American history. The mistake that he made, and I have the honor of telling it to him personally, <laughs> is that after the election, when he had so much energy, so many millions of people prepared to stand with him, Essentially, what he said is, thank you for getting me elected. I'll take it from here. I'll negotiate with John Boehner. I'll negotiate with Mitch McConnell. And I'll work out some good compromises. The truth is, of course, these guys never had any intention of seriously negotiating. But the bigger truth is, the only way we transform America for working families is when millions of people Stand up and tell Republicans this country is going forward. We're going forward with them, we're going forward around them, we're going forward through them, we are going forward. And the only way that happens is when millions of people stand together. President Obama said thank you to the people who supported him parted ways. I will not make that mistake. I'll need your help the day after the election. <laughs> Let me touch on some of the major issues facing our country. And one of the problems we have as a nation is, sadly, we have a media which is more interested in conflict, in gossip, in a soap opera type campaign, rather than enabling us <clears throat> to discuss and debate the burning issues. And I am going to do my best not to be attacking Hillary Clinton, not to be attacking anybody else, but to be bringing forward my ideas as to how together we transform America. And here's the first issue on my agenda. This is an issue we have got to lay on the table. It's an issue that I have been talking about for a long, long time. And it's an issue that I am happy that other people are beginning to talk about. And that is the grotesque level of income and wealth inequality in America. fact that we together are going to have to address that issue. Here is the facts. Here are the facts. The facts are that today the United States has more income and wealth inequality than any major industrialized country on earth. Worse today in America than any time since 1928. Fact today, the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90%. That in the last 30 years, we have seen a massive 
transfer of wealth. You know, my Republican friends get very nervous when we talk about redistribution of wealth. Everybody in this room should know that in the last 30 years there has been a massive redistribution of wealth from the middle class to the top one, 10 to 1%. We have got to turn that around. There is something profoundly wrong when one family in America, the Walton family of Walmart, owns more wealth than the bottom 130 million Americans. In the last two years, the last two years, the 14 wealthiest people in this country saw their wealth increase by $157 billion. More wealth than is owned by the bottom 40% of the American people. Right now, oh, well over half of the new income being generated is going to the top 1%. This is a rigged economy, an economy that is immoral, it is unsustainable, it is not an American economy, and we are going to change that economy. campaign is sending the message to the billionaire class and that message is you cannot have it all. You can't get huge tax breaks when children in New Hampshire and Vermont go hungry. You are going to start paying your fair share of tax breaks. In an economy where millions of people are struggling to find jobs, you cannot continue to send our jobs to China and other low-wage countries. You cannot continue to put your billions in profits in the Cayman Islands and in other tax havens. We're going to end those tax loopholes. When we talk about what's going on in America, it is not only the grotesque level of income and wealth inequality. It is the tragic reality that for the last 40 years, we don't talk about it, the last 40 years, the great middle class of America, once the envy of the entire world has been disappearing in New Hampshire, in Vermont, all America, all over America, despite in exploding technology and increased worker productivity, the American people are working longer hours for lower wages. That's not what our economy should be about. We should not be in a situation where median family income has gone down by almost $5,000 since 1999. We should not be in a situation where men and women are struggling mightily, working incredible hours, two jobs, three jobs, trying to cobble together an income. That should not be what goes on in America. We need an economy that works for all of us, not just the top 1%. And when we talk about the economy, it's not only income and wealth inequality. It is unemployment. Let me say a word on that. Every month the government produces a study, a statistic, which talks about official unemployment. Nationally, that official unemployment is 5.3%. It's actually lower in Vermont than New Hampshire. But everybody in their gut knows there's something wrong there, and there is. And what's wrong is that there's another government statistic that looks at people who are unemployed, who are underemployed, who are working in part-time work when they want to work full-time, who have given up looking for work. When you add all that together, unemployment in America is 10.5%. And let me tell you something even worse, which we never, ever talk about and we have got to start acting on. 
and that is the tragedy regarding youth unemployment in America. I recently asked the Economic Policy Institute to do a study for me, looking at real youth unemployment and underemployment. This is what they found. Listen to this. For high school graduates between 17 and 20 years of age, if they are white, youth unemployment and underemployment is 33%. If they are Hispanic, 36%. If they are African American, youth unemployment and underemployment is 51%. This is a tragedy of unbelievable consequence. What it means is we're turning our backs on millions of young people who want independence, who want some income, who want to get out of their home, who want dignity, who want to stand on their own two feet. Right now in America, we got five and a half million young people who have no jobs, who are not in school. And if anyone thinks that it is a coincidence, that the United States today has more people in jail than any other country on earth, you would be mistaken. There is no coincidence. In my view, it makes eminent sense from a human point of view, from an economic point of view, to be investing in education and jobs rather than jails and incarceration. I want to end, I want to end the sad reality that America has more people in jail than any other country with the reality that we have the best educated population on earth. We can do that. We can do that. Now, when we talk about the economy, it's income and wealth inequality, it's high unemployment, it's the tragedy of youth unemployment. But it is also wages in America. So let me be as clear as I can be. The federal minimum wage of seven and a quarter an hour is a starvation wage. It's got to be raised to a living wage. Wage over the next several years should be 15 bucks an hour. I don't think, I don't think it's a radical idea to say that in this great country, if somebody works 40 hours a week, that person should not be living in poverty. And when we talk about wages and income. What we also have got to end in this, is this absurdity that women today are making 78 cents on the dollar compared to men. <laughs> Guys, are we going to be standing with women and fighting the fight for pay equity? Establish pay equity, and women are earning fair wages, you're going to take a big, big chunk out of poverty. Single women, in fact, will be able to raise their families with dignity. Now, here in New Hampshire, every candidate in the world comes dropping through. You hear a lot of speeches. I don't envy you. Uh, you hear a lot of nonsense. And one of the pieces of nonsense you hear is a lot of my Republican colleagues talking about family values. They just love families. Stay up nights worrying about families. Well, you all know what they mean by family values. What they mean, and by the way, what the recent attacks on Planned Parenthood are about, they believe that women should not have the right to control their own bodies. I disagree. It is really hard to believe it's men. It is really hard.
want to believe as a man, and I think other men see this as well, that women are actually told they cannot get the contraceptives they need. That is not a family value. That is something that I strongly, strongly disagree with. And when you heard here about Republican family values, what they are also telling us is that our gay brothers and sisters should not have the rights, same rights as straight couples, should not have the right to legally marry. I strongly disagree with that. Four kids who have seven beautiful grandchildren who's been married for 27 years. I believe in family values. I believe that we need legislation to support loving families. It's just that my view of family values is a little bit different than Republican views. And I'll tell you what my views are. My view is that the United States should end the international embarrassment of being the only major country on earth which does not guarantee working people paid medical and family leave. We are the only major country on earth. Now here's what that means in concrete terms. Today, Hampshire today in Vermont, a woman is having a baby. If that woman and her family have decent income, she will be able to stay home for a reasonable period of time, getting to know her baby, getting to love her baby. Father can stay home as well. I cannot imagine any family value more important than that. But if that woman in Vermont or New Hampshire does not have a lot of money, she will be forced to go back to work in five days, in eight days. She will be separated from her baby. That is not a family value. That is why we must guarantee three months of paid family and medical leave to move on. 